Amen. So we're going to do chapter 12. We're going to get through verse 28. So if you came expecting us to talk about the plague and the death of the firstborn, we're not going to get there tonight. We're going to we're going to get there next time. We might get there tonight if we breeze through this, but it hadn't looked like we breezing through anything here lately. So we may uh, it may take a little longer than normal. But as we looked at chapter 11 last week, what we saw was that the final plague is now being set in motion. Anybody want to summarize what happened last week in the 10 verses of chapter 11? What did we see last week? Everybody indeed got mad, for sure. And so, God's word is absolutely true. And God's word is absolutely true. That's true. So Moses went in again. God sent him into Pharaoh. And um, Pharaoh, because of the darkness, the plague of darkness, Pharaoh said, you guys can leave, um, but we're going to keep your cattle. Remember that right? Am I right about that? And basically Moses said, no, nope, all our cattle's going with us as well. Uh, and Pharaoh got angry and basically told Moses, he said, you get out from my presence and if I see you again, I'm going to kill you. And before Moses leaves Pharaoh's presence, we begin in chapter 11, verse 1. It told us in a parenthetical comment that God had told Moses that it was going to be one more plague. And so Moses announces without any warnings, without any, this is, you know, you need to let my people go, without any of that that he has said so many times before. He just announces the last plague. One last plague I'm going to send. And he announces the plague of the death of the firstborn in all of Egypt. And so this has, this has now been set in motion, and when Moses got done, uh, he left, it does say he left in anger. Moses was angry because Pharaoh had threatened him. Uh, he left Pharaoh's presence in anger. But now this is the culmination of what all of this has been leading up to. There's no more warnings now, no more chances for Pharaoh to let the people go on his own. Uh, the plague, the death of the firstborn is what everything has been moving toward. If you remember, you don't have to turn there, but if you remember way back in chapter 4, verses, verse 23, when, when Moses was, before he came to Egypt and God was telling him, this is what you're going to do, you're going to, I'm going to send you to Egypt, you're going to go to Pharaoh. He told Moses, he said, you're going to tell Pharaoh that you are going to release Israel, my firstborn son, and if you don't, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. So all of this has been moving toward this final plague uh, and... What we're going to see in chapter 12 is that the death and judgment uh, is going to fall on Egypt after all of the nine plagues and Pharaoh refusing to let God's people go. So before we get to that, instead of uh, Moses saying, okay, this is going to happen, Moses leaving, and then we see the plague, what God's going to do in chapter 12, verses 1 through 28, is he's going to explain through Moses to Israel the preparations that they must make before the final stroke falls, before the judgment falls. And we're going to look at those preparations. This is a section of Scripture that you probably know very, very, very well. Many, many a sermon have been preached on it. So you'll probably have, we'll probably have lots of comments and lots of questions as we get into it. So let's just read verses 1 through 13, just so you get the general gist of what's going on. And then we'll back up and we'll go through the whole thing. So, what happened? That's not right. This month shall be... Oh, okay, it's different over there. Hey, but... That's cool, though, ain't it? Okay. I was looking for that, and I didn't see it, and I thought, well, what is different? Okay, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt... This month shall be for you the beginning of months. Remember, they had just come out of Pharaoh's presence. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, 
you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel, which is, you know, the, the cross beam at the bottom, of the ho- or is that at the top? It's at the top, that's yes, right, sorry. And of the houses in which they eat it, they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it. With your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. We'll stop there. We're going to go through 28, but we'll stop there. So what's happening here? is Moses has just left Pharaoh's presence. He's announced the final plague that's coming. Uh, Pharaoh got mad. We saw it again that his heart was hardened and he refused to let them go. God knew it was going to happen. God told Moses this is going to happen. And then as Moses is leaving Pharaoh's presence, the final plague announced, God comes to Moses and he says, okay, the final plague's coming. The people of Israel have to prepare. Remember, back in chapter 11, God said He wasn't going to do this plague through Moses or through Moses' staff or through Aaron like He had done the previous nine plagues. How was this plague going to be administered? God said, I will come to Egypt. God's presence is coming to Egypt. And it's coming to Egypt and it's going to pass through the land of Egypt, including the land where Israel dwells. So he's telling his people, you, you better prepare for my holy presence that's going to, be coming, uh, going to be coming on this night. And he gives instructions for his people's salvation through, through judgment. And they must prepare themselves in faith. So the first thing he does, well, what happened? It's still up there. Oh, okay. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. That's the last one, and I'm correct. Y'all ready? All right. Verse 1 and 2. He says it's about to happen, and the first thing that he tells Moses to tell Israel is, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So he's saying what's about to happen right here is the firstborn of Egypt is going to die, but at this plague, Pharaoh is going to let them go. God already told Moses, one more plague and Pharaoh will let you go. They will, they will be freed. And God says this, is, this month is now going to be the beginning of your calendar, the beginning of your, cal- your yearly calendar. The deliverance from Egypt that he's going to give to Israel is now uh, a, a new beginning, if you will, for, for Israel. From now on, every time they look at the calendar, they're going to remember this event. It'll be a defining moment. The Exodus is a defining moment in Israel throughout the entire Old Testament in the life of Israel. In the rest of the Old Testament, all through the prophets, all through the writings, you're going to hear God say through His prophets, through His people, uh, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the God who, who saved you out of bondage. This event, the Exodus, is going to define God as the God who saves His people to them. It's going to be the event that defines His people as God's people whom He delivered out of slavery, out of bondage. And here we see it's going to also define a new start for them, a new way of seeing time, I guess. It's going to begin their calendar. We have a similar way of marking time by God's covenant, don't we? What is it? Huh? I can't, man, I really, I'm sorry. He said Easter. We can look at Easter the same way that they looked at that. Yeah, that's, that's actually the way. Okay. Jesus. It's at least at Easter. That's true too. Huh? Jesus. Jesus. Say. Oh, 
Man, I'm having trouble. I'm going to clean these things out here. The, the birth of Jesus? Yeah. So, you, they don't, I don't know if they teach this in school anymore, but it used to be B.C. and A.D. Now it's B.C.E. and C.E., which don't make no sense to me. But B.C., before Christ, and what does A.D. stand for? Anybody know? <laughs> it's not after death. It's not after death. No, it's Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. So every time you write 2022 on your check, do people still write checks anymore? I don't know. Every time you write 2022, you are testifying to the Lord. The year 2022, the year of our Lord, 2022 A.D. We, we mark time by the Lamb of God Himself who came. It began a new era for us when Jesus came. And so after God talks to Moses about the marking of time, this is going to be a new year. This is the, mar- the beginning of your calendar from now on. He shows them how to be saved from this judgment that is about to fall on, on Egypt. And this, you, we read it just a moment ago, so you know it's the institution of the Passover. It's, uh, the Passover points forward to Christ and to the Lord's Supper. Uh, the meal and the sacrificial lamb demonstrate God's salvation on several different levels, and we'll talk about that. Um, and he gives it, in, if you, as we were reading it, I'm sure you saw that he was giving it in very detailed instructions. Like, it wasn't just, hey, go get a lamb and eat it one night when I come. It was very detailed as to how you were to do it and the way you were to do it and what time you were to do it. It was very detailed through this because it is a serious thing to come into the presence of a holy God. Something serious was about to happen. God was going to visit Egypt and they must prepare for for his presence. So the first thing he does is gives instructions on how to choose the lamb. In verses 3 and 4, it says, Tell the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Okay, so each each family in Israel was to take, each household in Israel was to take a lamb and they were to take it. Make sure you notice that on the 10th day of this month. The month was called Abib at that time, but it changed later to the month of Nisan. So it was the month, uh, on this month, they were to take it on the 10th day, very, very specific. And make sure you notice this as well. The Passover was not a solitary feast. It was observed in community. There's no temple or tabernacle at this time. So the first place of worship, the first place of um, substitutionary sacrifice, if you will, was their homes and their families. And if the family was tiny, the neighbors would come and they would join them in their houses. Moses told all of Israel they were instructed to eat this feast. Uh, This is actually the first time that the Bible uses the word congregation for Israel. You see Israel becoming a nation. They are a nation of people, but he's going to lead them out and make them his nation. And so the whole congregation of Israel would gather in their homes or in their neighbors' homes if they had small families, and they were to take a lamb, and they were to choose the lamb and take him into their house on the 10th day of the month. They're to share a single animal. Make sense? Questions, comments? No? And they were dependent. It was the number of people that would eat the lamb was dependent on how much one person or the people there could eat. So the point is that, the point really is that everyone in the house had to eat the meat of the lamb. And all of the lamb had to be eaten. We're going to see a little later that if any is left over, they had to burn it. So the eating of the sacrificial lamb, how does that point to Jesus Christ? Come on, that's an easy one. Huh? Jesus, his word. Yeah, how does it point to Jesus? He, the Last Supper. The Last Supper? But Jesus is also our... Yes, Jesus instituted the Last Supper at the Passover. Huh? Yeah, we hadn't got there, but you're right. <laughs> she said it's a male without defect. That's right. Jesus, what I'm looking for is Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 
He's the Lamb of God. That's how it points to Christ. And the eating of the Lamb of God, did Jesus ever say anything about eating Him as the Lamb of God? Didn't He? Didn't he? John chapter 6, remember it? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is truly food, my blood is truly drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. He's talking about, now, he, he didn't mean literally eating his flesh, he was talking about himself being the Passover lamb, being the bread from heaven. He was talking about himself as the substitute, as the sacrifice. And so they're to choose a lamb, and now they're told how to, how to select it, what the qualifications were, and how to kill it. He says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day in this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So there's a whole lot of information there, specific information. The lamb, you're right, uh, Miss Susan, should be a spotless male. You remember last week we had that discussion about whether first, firstborn meant firstborn or firstborn son? Well, I think this is the answer. It meant firstborn son. First of all, it was a masculine noun, so that kind of lends it, but the substitute for the death of the firstborn in that house was to be a male lamb. So in my mind, and I, I'll take correction if somebody can, can show me, but in my mind it was the firstborn son that was, and that's why it was translated so in, in our English Bibles that way so many times, because the lamb had to be a male. It had to be not just a male, but a spotless male. Why did it have to be spotless? Without blemish. Yeah, because it points to Jesus, but it was a sacrifice. It was a substitute. It wasn't just a meal for sustenance. Like, okay, you guys, we're fixing to leave, so let's all, you know, it's like we do with our kids. Make sure you eat now before we leave. We're not stopping. It wasn't that kind of meal. It was a meal that was a substitute for one who was going to die. The lamb was going to take the place of the firstborn dying in that household. And the lamb was going to be killed, the blood put on the door, and God would pass over that house because a death had already occurred in there. It was a substitute. It was a sacrificial meal and a sacrifice as we see all through the Levitical law, all the way up to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ must be spotless, must be perfect, must be without blemish. Uh, and so... He gives them, he gives them, you take it from the sheep or the goats, but it has to be a male, has to be a year old, has to be without blemish. And he says, you're going to keep it until the 14th day of the month. When were you to select it and bring it into your house? The 10th day. So how many days did you keep? You had to keep good math skills, everyone. You had to keep it four days in the land. The lamb had to be killed at a certain time, kept it until the 14th day, and they would keep it four days, and it had to be taken care of. It wasn't just like put it over in a corner and leave it. It had to be taken care of. It had to be kept healthy because, remember, sickly animals didn't qualify for a sacrifice. So it had to be fed. It had to be nurtured. It had to be taken care of. Yeah, it had to, be, had to be taken care of. What was the importance of selecting it and taking it in on the 10th day and then sacrificing it on the end, at the end of the 14th day. Anybody know? Maybe so. That's a, good, that's a good point. He said you invest in it, you grow attached in it. Can you imagine the little kids, you know, like, oh, look, the lamb's in the house. Oh, what? We're going to do what? So the first real trouble I got in as a pastor and a youth minister was I came up with this. I had a, a lesson for the youth group. It was probably 40 kids in this youth group. And I had this great lesson based on, there's lots of good sermons based on the blood on the doorpost and the blood of the lamb and all that. Uh, and so what I had was an object lesson. What I, what I did was I took this stuffed lamb, like a, you know, a lamb that you would find, and I, I, before I went in, I, I cut all the stuffing out of it, you know, took all the stuffing, and I took Ziploc bags, and I put red food coloring all in the Ziploc bags, and I put them all up in the lamb, 
And, you know, and so I was walking around showing them, like, we take this lamb in our house, and the Israelite, and I was being just as sweet and as, as kind as I possibly could, and, and, we, and we nurture the lamb, and we take care of the lamb when it's in our house. And then, then on the day that God said, and I pulled a box cutter out and went, Rap! and, and I, had a tar- I had a tarp on the floor, it's okay. It was a pretty good object lesson, thank you very much. I wanted them to see that sacrifice was bloody. It was not a beautiful, you know, it's not a beautiful romanticized. It was gross, and it was bloody, and it was, if you walked into the tabernacle or the temple after, after months and years of sacrifice, it stunk, and it was nasty, and the whole, the whole thing was the, the, the necessity of our sin, which is gross and nasty, being atoned. The only thing I wasn't planning on was all the kids, when I lay, the lamb was laid out in the floor all bloody and gross, they all took their phones out and took pictures and posted them on Facebook. And the stuffed lamb looked like a real animal in the picture. So all the people in town thought, what are they doing out there at that church? They're sacrificing animals. It took a while for me to live that one down. But it must be killed, they said. This is, remember, this, this is, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys are farmers or country, country people and, you know, raised slaughtering hogs and chickens. And stuff. It, it, it's, it's gross. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not pretty. It's not, and, they're, and they're doing this in their house. They're doing this with their family. Uh, they would kill their lamb at twilight. Most, uh, most people that I read thought that twilight would be between anywhere between three o'clock and five o'clock in the in the evening as the sun was going down, uh, and so it these lambs would have been slaughtered roughly at the same time that Jesus was crucified, and that's the point that he is the Passover lamb. And you look in the New Testament; it was at the time of the Passover that Jesus went to the cross. And there were some. I don't know how this works, and I, I'm I don't know. Depending on, depending on how you count the days. You know, the Jews counted days differently than we do. They counted them from sunset to sunset, you know, which is a little different than the way we counted them. But there were several people that made the connection that Jesus rode into Jerusalem uh, four days and then sacrificed and then crucified just like, the, uh, just like the Passover lamb. That only works if you count the days the way the Jews did and not the way we do. But it's very, very interesting. And it's for sure that this is, you know, Paul says that Jesus is our Passover lamb. So this points to him. And what were they to do with the blood? They were to smear it on the doorpost. So take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house where they eat it. There shows that this is a sacrificial, a substitutionary death. Death was coming to every house in Egypt. Let me say that again. Death was coming to every single house, Egyptian and Israel alike. Either the firstborn in the family was going to die or a substitute was going to die in the lamb that was given. And that blood was smeared on the doorpost. It's going to say later, uh, as we read verse 12 and 13, that that blood is a sign to you that I'm going to pass over your house. That blood would be shed. That's really the point of the cross, isn't it? His blood for mine. You know, his blood shed so that my blood and my, for my sin, my death doesn't have to be shed. That blood would be shed, but it also had to be applied, didn't it? He didn't say just shed the blood and everything's going to be fine. He said, you're going to take that blood and you're going to put it on the outside of your door frame. It's an act of faith. And we'll see that in a minute. Verse 8 and 9, he says, that it must be roasted and eaten with unleavened bread. It must be eaten in haste. He says, must be eaten with, uh, why roasted? Why roasted and not boiled? What does it say? Roasted on fire, unleavened bread. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but it has to be roasted. Why? Anybody know? I don't have a perfect answer, so just tell me what you think. Yeah, there's one, there were several people that said it was because you know the Israelites weren't allowed to eat the blood. They were supposed to... Uh, slaughter animals a certain way in order to eat it, but, but all of the food laws hadn't been given yet, so they didn't probably weren't aware of all those things. But he says, okay, this is how I want you to cook it, how I want you to prepare it. It is to be roasted. And it's, um, 
You know, it's also, there were several that said the, the roasting of it kind of symbolized the, the suffering of the Messiah and the Passover lamb. That may be true, but I don't know how you would prove that from the text. I don't know how you would uh, make sure that. But uh, what about unleavened bread? That's an easy one. Why unleavened bread? Huh? Yeast represents sin. How'd you know that, Linda? <laughs> Yeast represents corruption, indeed. We'll see that in a minute. But also, you got to hurry up. You ain't got time to be letting your bread rise. That was the point. He said, you're going to be eating this. You're, you're correct. You are right. It's going to say that here in a minute. Uh, but... Yeast was, you didn't have time to let your bread rise. You were going to eat it unleavened. You were going to eat it with bitter herbs. Some of the people that I read this week said that the bitter herbs uh, was a reminder of the same word, bitter service, that uh, uh, Pharaoh put upon the Israelites in chapter 1. Um, and, you know, uh, roasting, eat it quickly, eat it with unleavened bread. And in verse 10, he said, it must be eaten entirely. The whole lamb was their salvation, not part of the lamb, not a piece of the lamb. It must be eaten entirely. It said, you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that does remain until the morning, you shall burn. And he says, in this manner, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, with your sandals on your feet, with your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So the idea is, the picture is that this lamb was their substitutionary sacrifice and it was the whole lamb that was the sacrifice, not just a piece of the lamb. So all of the lamb had to be eaten. All of the lamb had to be eaten, and anything that was left over uh, that, that couldn't be eaten, they were full or whatever, it had to be burned outside. It had to be burned uh, in, the, in the fire that they were roasting the, the lamb on. This is a communion meal. So... When the meal's over, the communion's done. It's not a meal for sustenance so they could save it for tomorrow or, or any, save it for later. God, they would have to depend on God to feed them as they left Egypt. And they were to demonstrate their faith by eating it in haste. They were to show their trust in God's promise by arranging themselves to be prepared to leave. Now, I want you to remember, we've heard this story a million times. You all know the story. You all know, you've heard this a bunch of times. They were to eat, you know, with their sandals on and their, their, their loins girded and their, their staff in their hand and all that kind of stuff. But think about how you would take this as an Israelite there in Egypt. I mean, remember, they've been in slavery 430 years. Everybody there had been born into slavery, had known nothing else ever in their whole life. And the idea now that they were actually going to leave, actually going to depart and go and serve their God in the land that was promised to them, it was probably hard to grasp. And so he was telling them, you're going to put your faith into action by, by getting everything ready for you to get out of here when Pharaoh and the Egyptians let you go after I come through and kill the firstborn. They should put faith, they should put action to their faith and dress to be ready to go. And they exhibit the faith that they were indeed going. Questions, comments, cries of outrage? Good. So it's not a typical meal that he has prescribed for them. Symbolically, it showed God's deliverance, showed their faith and obedience. They had to, they had to select the lamb. They had to do all the things God had meticulously said. They had to spread the blood on the doors. They had to dress a certain way as they ate it. They had to cook it a certain way. They had to eat it a certain way. And they could only eat, you know, if, if they couldn't keep any left over. There was meticulous instruction as to why, as to what they had to do. And then in verse 12 and 13, he tells them why. He says, you're going to do all of this for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And he says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So he says, the reason why you're engaging in this 
meal, this sacrificial meal, this communion meal of the substitutionary lamb and putting the blood on the door. The reason is because I am coming to Egypt and I am going to strike the firstborn in Egypt that night. Both man and beast, all the firstborns will die. And he even says, I'm going to judge the gods of Egypt, which we've seen through the plagues as each, each, uh, each uh, realm of the plague that God had sent was a different uh, set of Egyptian gods that were supposedly rulers of, of the Nile and of the sky and of all those things. And, and God showed his, his sovereignty over all of them. And the same thing is true here. The God of death in Egypt was Osiris and his assistant was Anubis, the God of the underworld. But God was going to prove on this night that once, for, once and for all that he was not just the most powerful God, but the only God. The Lord of life and death. Remember at the beginning of all of this in Exodus, God, Moses came to Pharaoh and he said, uh, the God of our fathers, Yahweh, says, let my people go that we might serve him. What did Pharaoh say? Who is your God? I don't know your God. Well, he knows him now. He knows he will know his name. He, and, and God said that through this whole plague narrative. And you will know that my name is the Lord when I bring this upon you. And so the Lord will pass over the blood. He says, it will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you, meaning there will be no judgment brought upon your household. It's to be a sign on the household that the house is placing itself under the protection and the mercy and the grace of God. The blood will show that a death has already taken place in there. Not the death of the firstborn, which God requires of all of Egypt, but a death of a perfect substitute for that firstborn. If that doesn't illustrate the gospel, I don't know what does. For Jesus is that perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is the substitute for our sin. His blood was poured out that we might be forgiven, though we are still sinners. And by faith, they offered a substitute, the firstborn, a substitute for the firstborn that was given. It was an act of faith to spread the blood on the doorpost. You know how I know that? Because the writer of Hebrews tells me that. In Hebrews eleven twenty eight, he's talking about Moses. He said, by faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. It was an act of faith. They were demonstrating their faith that the blood would cover them by the grace and the mercy of God. That's the same as it is today. It's an act of faith where we trust that Jesus' blood covers our sin, atones for our sin, that we don't fear the judgment and the wrath and the punishment of God for that judgment wrath has been taken upon the Son of God. And by faith, we trust in Him. It took a lot of trust, don't you think, for them to know. I mean, they've seen the hail, they've seen the locusts, they've seen the flies, they've seen the frogs. They, they know this is real. And here comes Moses, is going, he's going to tell the elders, and the elders are going to announce to them all of the things that have been said here. And now the, every firstborn is going to die. And the only way that this is not going to happen in your household is if that lamb's blood is, is over that doorpost. Can you imagine, okay, you're, you're doing what God said to do. You're taking your lamb at the right day. You kill it at the right time. You, you cook it the right way. And you take that blood and you spread it on the doorpost. And then you just sit in your house and wait. Can you imagine what that was like? We're going to see at the end of this chapter. We're not going to get to it tonight. But when we get to the end of this chapter, it's going to say that there was a wail and a screaming through the land of Egypt like had never been heard before. And he says this, because in the land of Egypt, there was not one house where there was not somebody dead. So you can imagine you're sitting, I mean, it, it probably felt a lot like Noah sitting in the ark, like, wonder what's going to, you know, people knocking on the side of the boat trying to get in, rain and thunder, and they're sitting in their houses trusting that by faith alone, by grace alone, because that blood is on the doorpost, no one's going to die in here. It's an act of faith, the same act of faith that we, that we engage in when we trust in Jesus. Questions, comments? Nothing, huh? Okay. So, as we move on, 
This moment is going to mark Israel for generations to come. It's going to be the foundation of John the Baptist's statement, Behold the Lamb of God, when he looks at Jesus, takes away the sin of the world. So after explaining how to be saved from the judgment by taking a lamb and cooking it the right way and spreading the blood, God then tells Moses that this event is going to not just be for one night, the exodus, it's going to mark a yearly remembrance in Israel's life even after they come out of Egypt. And beginning in verse 14, he gives them instructions for celebrating the Passover in future generations and celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread in future generations. He says in verse 14, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Some of your translations may say ordinance there. Verse 15 says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So, this is going to be a celebration forever, he says. Purpose is for remembrance, for, for worship, a feast unto the Lord. Uh, it's clearly for the future generations. It's a seven-day feast. They're not going to have a seven-day feast when they come out of, of Egypt on the night of the Exodus. Um, it's for the benefit of the generations to come that didn't participate in the, in the Exodus. And it's going to be a lasting ordinance. So the Passover is not just an event for one night. It's going to be a yearly reminder of what God has done and what God is continuing to do. They are never to forget the deliverance that God brings to them on this night. But if you read the Old Testament in several different places, there were spans of hundreds of years where they didn't observe the Passover, where they didn't observe the feast, where they failed to remember what God had done, where they failed to revere God for what He has done as He commanded. And we can all see that tendency in us as well. I call it the what have you done for me lately syndrome. We take for granted what He's done. One of the biggest things is salvation in general. I can't count how many people, you know, it's just in our culture, especially our modern American culture where we're so blessed and we have so many things and comforts and all of those things, we take for granted our salvation. And we don't, we don't revere that salvation. It, it's really like the first step to get with God and now we need to seek for something else when the reality is the, the, the grace through faith that brought us into relationship with God, that is, walking in that is the Christian life and there's no greater joy, there's no greater um, the fulfillment than understanding you're reconciled to God, not by your works, but by the blood of Christ, by grace through faith. And when we leave that, when we forget that, when we uh, think less of that, we go striving for joy in all kind of different things, even good things, but they can never provide it because we were designed for that relationship with God. And so we have a tendency, just like Israel did, to take that for granted, to be lax in serving Him in the way that He commands, to forget what God has done, that He is the God who saves us. So these things that we're talking about, you know, they're important for us to hear as well. In verse 15, it says that you are to remove all the leaven from your house to prevent probably the slightest possibility of any bread or any breaded food would accidentally be yeasted or, or leavened or whatever you want to call it. Why is that a word? Yeasted? Is that that it's a it's a word now. Yeah. So I may not be thinking about this right. I read this, I don't know anything about it, but when they made bread, I'm gonna mess this all up, so y'all gonna have to help me. So they would take a piece out of it and save it for the next batch or something like that, right? It's like I used to do I used to have people that gave me Amish bread and they would save a and it would start a new deal. And so there was always a time where there was leaven in the house because when that bread was gone to bake more, they would use the well, there's going to be a time, he says, you just get it all out of the house. You're going to start fresh. You're going to start over. There's not going to be any leaven in the house. Um, and we've already seen no leaven, unleavened bread, because they were to make it in haste and they were to eat it in haste. But what does the leaven point to? Linda? <laughs> she, that's right. She said sin. 
sin or corruption. And the reason we know that is not just because we look at it and we say, well, it's got to be sin because it symbolizes sin. Paul actually tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when he's talking about the immorality that's in the church. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, he's, telling, now, he's not talking about Exodus or, or Israel or anything. He's talking to the church about their sin. And he says, your boasting is not good. And then he says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. He's using the same picture as the Passover. And he says, as you really are unleavened. And then he says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He makes the connection of leaven being uh, symbolic or a picture or a type of, of sin and corruption that is to be removed. And make sure you notice this when we're talking about the Passover and the Passover feast and Jesus Christ. Um, he, doesn't say, he doesn't say that um, the Lord's Supper is our Passover. He says Christ is our Passover. Uh, Christ is the one who instituted the Lord's Supper and, and reshaped the meaning of that feast and that, that meal that they took. But it's Christ who is our Passover lamb. So even Paul, a Jewish man, would, was saying to them, listen, Christ is the fulfillment of the Passover and of the lamb. So we're no longer cooking lambs the way that they said to cook them in Exodus over roasting and spreading blood on doorposts and stuff like that. We are, Christ is our Passover lamb and he fulfilled that for us. So we, we can't know absolutely for sure, but that leaven that they were to get out of their house was a picture of being holy before the Lord, remembering His holiness, especially for future generations. Remember, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about in the future generations when they celebrate this, they were to remove all the leaven from their house. They were to remove it out. Don't save the old leaven. You start over and make unleavened bread for seven days. And it was serious. But he says, it, look, if you, if you, let me go back. He says, if you eat, any person that eats leaven from the first day to the seventh day in this week of unleavened bread, this week of celebration, that person shall be cut off from Israel. What does that mean? Excommunicated. Excommunicated. What else? Die. I mean, that's it. Yeah, I don't know if it meant die. Well, you think he'd kill them? Yeah. I mean, it's possible. I, I have, there are some people who believe that. You know, the, the cut off from the people is used like 36 times in the Old Testament, and it's always connected to some abominable sin. Uh, and basically, and this is what I think, we can, we can debate the issue if you want to, but they're being ostracized from the people of God. They're no longer in the covenant people of God. May even have been physically removed from the people of God, cast away from the people of God. And, and so... It's very, very serious. It's a very serious thing, this, not just the Passover, but the future celebrations of the Passover as they remembered what God has done. And the question always comes up, why don't we celebrate the Passover? Uh, the reason why is because of what Paul says there. Jesus is our Passover lamb, and he instituted for the church the ordinance of the Lord's Supper during the Passover. He said, from now on, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Uh, all those things. Questions, comments? Okay. Verse 16. We're moving quite along. I don't think we're going to get done with this one either. On the first day you should hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. What was a holy assembly? Anybody know? Take a guess. Yeah, they would worship. It was a day of reverence, a day like a Sabbath day. It was devoted to worship, devoted to the Lord for commemoration, for remembrance. So on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as they celebrated the deliverance God had given them on the first day and on the seventh day, they would have a holy assembly. And it could be that God just wants their full attention upon Him. Set all else aside and devote themselves to Him. They're eating unleavened bread in remembrance of the Passover all week long and the first and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread would be days dedicated to the Lord, devoted to His service for remembrance and for worship. 
In verse 17 it says, You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. The feast is to remember the Passover, to look back as a memorial for all generations to come. It would come also to be a testimony foreshadowing what? The true lamb that would come to take our place, to take the place of the death that we owe. Now, in 18 through 20, I'm going to blow through these last ones because basically 18 through 20 is just a restatement of what we've already said. In the first month from the 14th day, the month of eating, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening for seven days. No leaven is to be found in your house. If anyone eats what is leavened, the person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in at all in your dwelling places. You shall eat you shall eat unleavened bread. Why do you think he repeat? I mean, not only is he repeating the command because he's already said it, but he repeats it three times in verses 18 through 20. Why is he repeating it so many times? Yeah. Need to make sure you understand. Make sure, it's, make sure that you understand that this is important. This is important. This is, and it's not just the ritual that's important. It's what it symbolizes. It's what it points forward to. It's what it points back to as they're remembering the salvation that God had given them. And then verses 20, 21 through 23, Moses faithfully tells them what God has said. So he's going to just re, restate everything that was said. And there's one little addendum in here that I want to show you that's just a little different. He says, Moses called the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel of the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. Now look at this. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Why? Yeah, well, you would die. Why would you die if you go out of your house until the morning? Because you're not under the blood. Not under the blood. The blood was the sign that God would pass over. The pass over. It. And so they would come to understand the blood is their protection. The lamb is their protection. Is their salvation. The blood would be their salvation so God would pass over them. And listen, Israel deserved judgment just like the Egyptians did. It was grace and mercy that God gave them the blood of the Lamb to pass over those things, to pass over their houses in judgment, just as it is grace and mercy today that God passes over His children in judgment when the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb, is covering our lives as well. Okay? 24 through 27 basically says you're going to pass down all this to your children. The Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and doorpost, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. They were even to do it as they came into the promised land. They were to use it as a remembrance, as a memorial, as a reminder of what God had done for them, of who God is. And the last thing we'll see, he says, you're to pass this to your children. Your children shall say to you, what do you mean by this service? What is this meal all about? You shall say it's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Do you know that the Old Testament exodus is the defining moment in Israel's history. It will define who they are all through David's life, through the kings, through chronicles, through the prophets. Through... It will define who they are in the Passover and the feasts of unleavened bread. and it will, it will define who they are, who their God is to them. 
And all of it was intended. It was intended by God to point forward to the exodus that we still celebrate. Did you know that we still celebrate the exodus? The true exodus? You know how I know that? Because it says so in Luke chapter 9. I love this. Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he was praying, as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothes became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Just based on the context of what you know about the gospel and what's going to happen in Luke, what do you think he means by his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem? What's he talking about there? He's talking about the death and resurrection. Do you know what Greek word is translated departure? Can you guess? Exodus. Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The exodus is a picture of the gospel. It was intended to be a picture of the gospel from first to last, from the selection of the lamb to the blood on the doorpost to the way the lamb was prepared to the faith that it took for them to put the blood on the doorpost and sit in the house while death and judgment surrounded them on all sides and to trust that their God was going to pass over them because a substitute, uh, a perfect substitute was given. And Luke, in writing his gospel, talks about Moses and Elijah. This is this is Moses here, standing with Jesus. Moses and Elijah, they really were Moses and Elijah. And Moses is talking to Elijah about the exodus which Jesus was about to accomplish. This is a picture of our salvation. And it's just as important for us today. And we engage in it the same way that they did. By grace through faith, we are given a lamb to be our substitute. And that lamb is the perfect substitute and his blood covers our sins so that judgment, punishment for the children of God under the blood of Christ will never come, not in this life or the next. He may discipline you when you sin, but punishment for your sin was taken upon the lamb of God on the cross. Questions, comments, cries of outrage? Okay, next week we get to see all the firstborn die. All right, let's pray. Father, we do love you, and God, we thank you. There's so many times where we're just like Israel, and we, we, we forget. We forget to commemorate your salvation that you've given us. We forget to worship you for who you are. God, if you never blessed us with another blessing in this life, you have given more than we can ever praise you for in the salvation through your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for the reconciliation that you have brought by taking us upon yourself, adopting us into your family, not because of our works, not because we're good, but because Jesus Christ died in our place. He was raised from the dead so that we too may be united with his life and have that life eternally. God, we, we come tonight in remembrance just to glorify your name for who you are. We come to glorify you and to thank you for the salvation that you have so freely given. We thank you that we, it's not of us, it's not anything we can earn nor maintain. It is a gift of grace. And God, we thank you that the blood covers our sins. God, we thank you for the gift that you've given. Help us to remember it. Help us to honor you for it. Help us to walk in it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.